Evan Brin, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, man. I'm so pumped for this. <laughs> me too, man. It's been uh, exciting just to hang out for the last hour or so. Likewise. Yeah. 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 We have a lot of awesome topics. We have football. We have the journey. We have cannabis, healing properties for things like CTE. We have consciousness, God, metaphysics, the big questions as well, mm -hmm. maximizing human potential. Mm -hmm. A lot of good stuff lined up. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> so fun. All right. Let's start with the journey. Yeah. Was it Burbank, right? Is where you're raised? Um, middle school and high school, yeah. I was born in New York City. Okay. Lived in Brooklyn until I was 10. My mom moved my brother and I out to L.A., Burbank, um, around 97, 98. So I went to middle school and high school in Burbank, California. The dream to play football and to play in the NFL started when I was about seven or eight at my grandparents' house in Connecticut watching on the news the Jets and the Giants in training camp. Um, and I just thought to myself, I want to be one of those gladiators. You know, I want to be one of those warriors that goes and competes, goes to battle every Sunday. And my mom would never let me play. She was, she was worried I'd get hurt yeah. for good reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but finally my freshman year of high school, I, with the help of my dad convinced her to let me play <laughs> and, uh, that was it, man. You know, everything from that moment on every, how I thought, how I carried myself, how I ate, how I trained the way I lived was in alignment to reach the top of that mountain, which was playing in the NFL. So, um, you know, and I was very blessed. I was surrounded by great people. You know, my mother, both my parents were very intuitive, holistically minded people. Food is medicine, exercise, drink plenty of water, use whatever natural means are available before going to a doctor to be prescribed some sort of medication or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, so that really infused my athletic life and, uh, pretty shortly thereafter, I don't, you know, my mom was so, she's a, you know, we come from this long line of mystics. My Whoa. earliest American ancestor is a woman named Mary Bliss Parsons. She came to the U S or came to America in 1630. Uh, with her husband, Cornette Joseph Parsons. She was on trial for witchcraft three times. Um, and really, I mean, when you break it down, what is witchcraft? At that time, it was being in tune with nature, you know, living with the earth, being disconnected from the stark, ice-cold, religious, um, you know, philo philosophy of the era. And so you were, women in particular were cast as witches and she got off every time, lived to be in her 80s, had 11 kids, one of them named Eben. Uh, he was killed in a battle with Indians at the age of 21. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think all of that, this internal knowing, this understanding of how the body works. My mom, you know, I grew up, my mom had a lot of really interesting, you know, there was a lot of darkness in my childhood, my parents getting divorced, a lot of mental health issues, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, substance abuse. Um, and, uh, you know, so that my childhood was laced with a lot of darkness, a lot of um, difficult times, but in the midst of all of that, my mother and my father, who, you know, my dad was always sort of a beacon of light, even in his sort of un inability, you know, to, you know, he was very much dealing with his own shit, his own darkness at the time as well. But he was always a very stable force while my mom was in a very difficult time. But even through that, 
you know, I remember she was, she had this boyfriend and as difficult of an environment as this guy created, he also, with my mother, they would go to these cadaver studies and they would do autopsies and look at the human body and learn about it. And she had all these books of anatomy and it really gave her this very intricate understanding of the human body and how it works. Uh, from a kinesiological perspective to a physiological perspective, she really understood how to get the body out of pain, yep. which was incredibly yes. important in my early career as a football player. And especially as a young kid, I had a number of growth spurts that wreaked havoc on my back. My back was always going out when I was a kid. I mean, I was, you know, I remember being 11, 12 years old and my back would go out. I couldn't walk, you know, and I'd be laid out on my back on the floor and my mom knew exactly what exercises to do to get out of pain, to get back on my feet. And, um, you know, my dad was always very intuitive with that as well. So I was very blessed. And when I was freshman year of high school, I'm playing football, and my mom would drag me and my brother to yoga classes. Yep. So that was sort of, you know, along with the brutality of the collision sport that I was, you know, just starting on, starting on this adventure into football, I had this great foundation of holistic healing and ancient knowledge of and at the time, it was very intuitive because since then, you know, I, I had no idea that yoga could be so beneficial, but it, intuitively, it made me a better football player. Yeah. You know, it made yes. me yes. more in tune with my body, made me more resilient, less prone to injuries. So I'm very grateful for that. So that's that's where the, the football dream started, man. <clears throat> And the lineage of mystic tradition, uh -huh. which is so interesting yeah. that f almost 400 years ago, you're coming from this deeper spiritual yeah. mysticism that then sort of bubbles up in your lineage to your parents, uh -huh. which then you take on intuitively, yeah. which makes sense today mm -hmm. that you are who you are because it wasn't just undergoing the process of it wasn't just football you fell in love with creative writing yeah which also makes a lot of sense yeah. with the mystic tradition uh -huh. and then and that's why i would also say that you're a really good writer because you can find on his website you can find really good or well articulate writing and then also that you knew that growing up you know i mean phil jackson and and the bulls also oh, yeah. you know he made yoga yeah. a priority yeah. and yoga means union in Sanskrit union with what the divine mm. your own unique relationship with the divine mm. yeah with both the unity of everything and also the unique self-actualization of your gifts and so of course it makes people better athletes right of course it makes people better <laughs> creatives better parents better everything yeah. yeah and so that's beautiful and makes a lot of sense yeah and so do you feel like you're, when you are sort of having this embedded mysticism within your lineage, which is so beautiful and crucial, I love that, that that was kind of one of those main influencers, not only in balancing out football with yoga, so mm. you had that style, but you also had balancing it out with you know, creative writing, do you feel like that was one of the key influences in you picking that up? Yeah, it's so interesting talking about this because, uh, you know, every time I do an interview or I talk to someone about my life or my history, my past, my path in the football and out of it, things come into more clearer context, yes. you know, because at the yes. time... I've only recently, only in the last couple of years, learned about my my deep family lineage. Yep. 
And part of that is in my purpose in this lifetime, which is rectifying a lot of my family pain and trauma. Um, Absolutely. You know, to answer your question, from the time I was a little kid, I had this sort of intuitive understanding of things. And that's not to say that I had it all figured out or I haven't made immense amounts of mistakes and been through tons of chaos and created chaos throughout my life. But I had this understanding of sort of how to do it, what it was I was always looking for. You know, Ram Dass talks about this thing where, you know, he spent so much of his life searching for the people who, searching for someone who knows, who yeah. knew, you yeah. know, knows what it's all about, you know. <laughs> and as a li- as little kids, we look up at adults and we go, they know. They know what it's about. And then you become an adult and you're like, these people don't they know a know fucking thing, thing, you know. <laughs> and so it, if you're a seeker, which, you know, at the very the most distilled finest point of what my life is all about. I'm seeking. I'm constantly seeking. Um, For the diamond necklace that is already around your neck. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly right. I love Um, that. Yeah. It's like that perfect balance between knowing you are already it, but also knowing that we're a work in progress always. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, So, you know, I had this really beautiful blend of, and that's who I am as well, which is really interesting. For instance, my birthday, October 14th, is the day of moderation in this birthday astrology book that we have. It's pretty funny, and it's to the T what what my day is. You know, it's, I'm a Libra to the utmost. And I'm four days, I'm four days before I'm you're the, the 10th, 10th October the 10th 14th. Libra and you're the day of moderation very deeply aligns with your middle path exactly metaphysics exactly yep. you know so as you start to for me as I've learned about myself as I've taken looks at my life as I've you know been given distance from this thing this everyday reality of you know being in this constant state of trying to do things succeed attain produce create aspire etc and you can for me through the practice of meditation yoga breath work psychedelic experiences it's given me this great distance to be able to look at my life and go, wow, I'm exactly who I am. You know, this is exactly who I am. And the stars say it so as well. Um, so, you know, my grandmother is an Academy Award winning actress. Her name's Estelle Parsons. Uh, she won Best Supporting Actress in Bonnie and Clyde. Her husband, my mother's father, who I never met, his name is Richard Gaiman. He's a famous American writer. He wrote countless stories for playboy magazine wrote a number of books um my father's a painter he's an artist uh as well as he was a very accomplished d1 basketball player at jacksonville university ironically Mm -hmm. um you know my mother ran a handful of fashion magazines you know and i say all of this because in the midst of my also you know when my parents got divorced I spent tons of time like I said up at, with my grandparents in Connecticut and my dad's three brothers my uncles and these men were saints you know for the most part as far as what they meant in my life and my brother's life and what they did for us and I mean we would spend three months of the summer up in Connecticut and we did nothing from sun up to sundown it was all sports every sport under the sun that you could think of and in that experience in the midst of going outside and shooting hoops all day or throwing the football around or going to the baseball diamond and you know hitting countless balls and fielding grounders and all of it there were art books there was great literature there was 
um, a recognition of the great thinkers of the world, you know. So I had this beautiful blend of brutal physical competition with very high level uh, artistic philosophical thinking. Um, Makes perfect sense. Right. I love that. Right. And so it was, I feel really blessed to have had that, you know, and some, somehow my football career was going exactly as it was supposed to, um, you know, given my, tr- my mind's eye trajectory, because I really had it in, it was visualization, you know, I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to play in the NFL one day. That's right. You know, and people would say, oh, that's fun. That's cool, Ed, but what's your plan B? And I'd say, there is no plan B. You know, that's what I'm going to do. The North Mm. Star was very clear. Napoleon Hill, think and grow rich. You had that visualized. And the universe fills it in. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I knew, you know, and exactly. I put it into my mind's eye. My mind put my body into action. Yep. You know. And so that took care of itself and I was surrounded by the right people and did the right things and everything went, came into alignment. And somewhere around my sophomore year of high school, I fell in love with writing. And then I found this writer, Brett Easton Ellis, who's written Less Than Zero and a handful of books. They're really fun. It's like, you know, very drug induced. His first book, Less Than Zero, he wrote in like a crack bin- bender at Bennington College in his creative writing program in two weeks. And I was like, wow, you can major in creative writing. That was where it kind of sparked this idea. And I said, okay, I want to find a college that made has creative writing as a major. So I'm getting tons of offers around my junior year, going into my senior year. I've got, you know, 50 scholar, full scholarship offers from schools all around the country, the whole Pac-10, Oklahoma, Tennessee, you know, LSU. And it really came down to who had a creative writing program in Arizona. I went on a trip to visit there. They were very aggressive in their pursuit of me, um, which I appreciated. And I liked the guys there and I liked what they were doing. I liked how they talked, but I came in, I went to a visit there and the woman who was giving this presentation about what the school offered said, well, we have a creative writing program that's top 10 in the country. Some people think it's the best in the world. And I said, boom, that's it. Yeah. You know, Um, so I chose Arizona because I can major in creative writing. I could play football. I could be part of this building a legacy, which has since sort of been completely obliterated (laughs) by the administration of Arizona, unfortunately. But uh, I could really be a part of this thing and I could do what I wanted to do off the field, you know, which was major in creative writing and pursue my artistic passions as a storyteller. Um, So there you go makes so much sense looking back and connecting the dots because as you're talking about being up in Connecticut you have your three uncles you guys are going hard on all the different sports which is fantastic for the body fantastic for coordination for so many different aspects to aesthetic and physical yet it's balanced perfectly with art with literature with philosophy with the greatest thinkers that style of balance is that synthesis mm-hmm. of science and spirituality or of athleticism yeah. and, and spirit. And yeah. that's, that's really powerful. And it makes so much sense leading up to why, you know, you had this profound moment, sophomore year, you're like, <clears throat> I can do creative writing. Uh-huh. It makes sense going to Arizona for a program that could fulfill that passion and creative writing, that North Star, that process was really beautiful hearing you talk about that something that we're obsessed with on the program is catalyzing other people's both self-realization of the unity of all being in existence, but also the self-actualization of their unique North stars, which really require that style of there's no plan B. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me about that. 
and I know that I have to grind and work hard every day, but that's the fire under my butt that excites me. It brings me meaning and fulfillment every day to achieve that yeah. transcendent noble aim yeah. of mine. I love It's that. really interesting yeah. listening to you say that. Because these are such manufactured ideas. It's like plan B and what you're going to do with your life. It's like, is there a plan B to your purpose on the planet? You know what I mean? Yes, I do. This is such nonsense that we've created in our sort of, I don't know what it is. It's the industrialization of the human mind. You know, it's, we've been civilized out of our humanity, you know, like we were talking about. Um, like talking about you at 19 being at the university of minnesota and saying dude how do i make this happen and the guy goes well come out to silicon valley dude you know and your your rational mind your conditioned culturated mind is going no man i gotta finish this degree i gotta because that's the line of that's the trajectory to get the job i want and all etc it's like no man we're not here to try and figure out what we're supposed to do with our lives. I said this the other day in a post, you know, I watch nature all the time. And obviously as a student of, you know, the great mystics, yep. I'm watching these hummingbirds in my backyard and they're just <laughs> floating from flower to flower, collecting nectar. Does anyone, would they have no shadow of a doubt of what they're doing yes. with their life? Yes. Ultimately, there's no nihilism. Everything has deep meaning and purpose. Yeah. And you came here with an intention to flower a specific soul purpose, an artistic execution and actualization into the world. And when we take it from that angle, it makes it much more evident for us as we're waking up and piercing the veil over time it's thinning and thinning and thinning and then we realize more and more our own true nature of our awareness and consciousness and we also realize what our true north star is and how there's absolutely nothing to do besides that that's the mm. only purpose right. is those realization and actualization mm. and yeah we can we can unpack I more. love that yeah as we as we go yeah you've what do you think that is why do we why are so many people stuck in not being able to access that or see through that it's just layers of distractions it's likely the way we purposely design the reality to be that way because uh -huh. it makes it fun because if you came knowing yeah yeah so we come forgetting yeah. and then as the Greeks said it's an amnesia or remembrance that mm -hmm. occurs yeah. and we remember what the true self is that uh -huh. we share that infinite self yeah. and that we are here to bring a gift yeah and we're yeah. here to bring a gift well what's the opposite of remembering dismembering oh amnesia well amnesia, we come forgetting. in dismembered yeah. oh dismembering there you go we come in dismembered and we remember and we remember yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, we usually say forgetfulness, amnesia, and remembrance, and amnesia. And this would be a good way to to bring up, like, what was going on was that you, you lined up this really interesting alignment of the stars in your own life uh -huh. where you had a familial mystic tradition that made it really clear that you had this perennial spirituality that was kind of built in in art and literature and philosophy, great thinkers, but also you had this incredible, harder, physical, sport, athletic, science side of things at the same time that you were balancing that with. And then that kind of led you into the football, the creative writing, the which also ended up in a sense as you're kind of getting through Arizona. This is kind of maybe one of the more interesting transitory moments because you had this North star of the NFL draft, but that there's this, there's this also strange, I don't know if you were feeling it at the time in Arizona, but that there's a strange, like, what am I actually putting my body through in this process? 
and only later downstream do we realize things and become an advocate like you are today for cannabis to heal rather than opioids and cte and all these problems with the actual physical vehicle of the body after it goes undergoes concussions and all of these devastating physical injuries and so were you feeling that also at the time at at arizona too I was very much in a warrior manifest destiny mindset at that point. You know, this was my life. I had really come to embody the persona of being a warrior, being a gladiator. So, you know, from the time I was a sophomore in high school, my right shoulder would subluxate. It would pop in and out of the socket. And uh, it wasn't a full dislocation because it would literally slide out and slide in. It was excruciatingly painful. Yeah. And I played through that for years and years and years. Um, and it would happen at least once a season. And I knew how to deal with it. I knew how to manage it. I knew how to do all the little exercises to keep the, the tiny muscles in there, the stabilizer muscles strong and healthy so that I could keep playing and doing what I had to do to play at a high level. So I was really, for a long time, there was, I was functioning with great reckless abandon as far as my body and mind went, you know. Um, and I lost connection with myself, you know, through the process of chasing this dream, chasing this idea of making it to the NFL. When I got to the NFL, finally, in 2009, I was drafted by the Jaguars, 39th overall in the second round. Um, and, you know, football for me was always a very, it was always a love-hate relationship, you know. I loved it because it was this place where I could exact my rage, my inner rage, and fire on others and be celebrated for it. <laughs> uh, I could physically dominate people and be praised. Gladiator, you've been saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but at the same time, it was super painful. It's yeah. it's a grind. Football yep. is really difficult. Yes. You know, but I loved that enough that that kept me going, and I had something to prove to the world. I had to show the world. Through the darkness of my childhood, I had to show the world how much I was to be feared. How scary I was, how tough I was, how badass I was. So v football was my vehicle to prove that to everyone else. And then I get to the NFL and I realize, fuck, I'm still not enough for myself. You know, I haven't proven anything, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. I've been an All-American. I've been All-Conference. I've been all this. I've been team captain every year that I've ever played football. And here I am, and I'm still not enough for myself. I'm still, you know, now I've, as the, as the, you know, the, the mission progressed, I had the house, I had the car. Now I had the family. I had a beautiful wife. I had a child. People loved me. And I wasn't enough, you know, for me. Um, and so this process of deconstruction happened and, you know, in the mind body, um, Osho, you know, Osho. Yeah. One of my other favorites, you know, he talks about how there's no disconnecting the mind and the body. Mm -hmm. It's one thing, yep. the mind body vehicle. Yep. Uh, and when you think about that rationally or from a, a logical standpoint it makes sense right I mean you don't think about opening and closing your hand you just do it it's all part of the the you know the synergy between the mind and the body it's just yes. one thing that's that's in constant flow yes. and that transcends to emotionally and psychologically psychically all the things happening they transcend into your physical tissues. So my body started breaking down. You know, I first I dislocated my shoulder my second year in the NFL. Was done for the season. All of that subluxating, finally it fully dislocated against the Kansas City Chiefs. That was also during a time where I'd just blown out my back. 
So going into my second year, I herniated a disc in my back, L5-S1, had excruciating L, uh, sciatic pain running down my leg, causing numbness in my right foot. I was in an immense amount of pain coming into the facility at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, get treatment, get in the hot tub, get rubbed down, get this, get that, just to get myself into a state where I could play. And I was starting at right tackle. So it was, it was a bit of a gift from God, a gift from the universe that my shoulder against the Kansas City Chiefs week seven or eight, uh, I fully dislocated my shoulder. I dislocated it in one play, popped it back in, finished the drive, yeah, yeah. came out, told our athletic trainer, I'm like, dude, I need a, I need a shoulder stabilizing strap, a shoulder sl- harness. Because we're about to go out for a two-minute drill before the end of the half. And he's like, I'm like, hurry the fuck up because i got to get back on the field. So he runs, gets the shoulder harness, laces me up, tightens it in. I'm like, okay, I'm back out on the field. Two plays in, I'm pass blocking. Shoulder goes out again. This time I can't get it back in. So I'm running off the field in the, in the midst of this two-minute drill. Three team doctors couldn't get my shoulder back in for about three or four minutes. They're like, Ed, can we get you into the locker room? I'm like, fuck no, just put it in. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, finally they get it in, take me into the locker room. I probably took some Vicodin, you know, got undressed, put my sweats on, went back out onto the field. I'm in this haze of opiates and I've got a massive dip in my mouth and and I'm just thinking to myself I'll be ready for next week yeah wow you know that's nuts and it wasn't until after that game where I went in and met with the team doctor and he said "Uh, you know you're you're done for the year I can't let you go back out and play you need to have surgery yeah to fix this and uh you know, that was the first time of my entire football career so that's my second year in the NFL where I wasn't going to be able to play because of an injury. And that, you know, that was a big moment. That was a big humbling experience. But I was still in the warrior mode. I'm like, okay, I'll have surgery. I'll come back next year be even stronger. You know, so, you know, my body over the next couple years, my back was a big issue. And then the next year, the lockout happened. So the owners locked the players out because we couldn't come to terms on a new collective bargaining agreement in 2011. So I went back to Arizona, finished my degree, wow, got rehabbed in my shoulder. Meanwhile, my back is still a mess. Hadn't addressed it yet. Still have sciatica running down my leg. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and it's funny when I'm growing up, I have my friends that are playing football because I'm an athlete playing different sports, but I didn't play football. But my friends, closest friends that are playing football, telling me about all these stories about because some of them are literally playing tackle. And uh-huh. when you're playing tackle, you're doing this motion where you're you're stressing the shit out of your shoulders when yeah. you're on the other players and you're on offensive tackle you have the defense as well that's pushing and you guys are doing this motion and they're you know that whole thing with the whole pop in the shoulder and then like it's like oh it's not a problem at all and then you just like put it back in place and you're like i got this uh (laughs) coach you know and the and the doctors and yeah the like you're saying there's this vicodin and like for pain killing and then like you're just like in the gladiator mode, like I'm ready for next week. Yeah. And it's so interesting hearing about that perspective of that. In many ways, it also resonates as like this entrepreneurial grind where people just treat, as you were uh-huh. saying, their uh-huh. mind body yeah. as nonsense, uh-huh. where really it's that soul vehicle where you have to have, which talk about in a bit but your obsession with that nutrition that sleep that exercise those the combination of that along with your north star is the only sustainable way to actually do it yeah 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 so all of that gets thrown out you know it gets thrown out of whack and you're out of alignment and then things start to get fucked up you know your shoulder dislocates you herniate a disc in your back you become injured 
you know, and so that was really the beginning of my complete obliteration, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. Um, but the trauma leads to the treasure. Exactly. This is so cool. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. So, you know, I had a few more years of that. Uh, the next, so the next year was the lockout. Shoulder was better. Training camp starts because we, we didn't have any spring because of the lockout. No spring OTAs. So we came right into training camp. And, uh, it was really, it was evident right away, you know, my back was still an issue. I'd come in, I'd be in there for two or three plays. I'd come out, you know, I couldn't feel my right leg. I was just a mess. And my head coach, Jack Del Rio, God bless him. I love him to death. He said, Eb, you got to just have back surgery, man. You know, at that point I had had a number of epidural injections right into my spine that did nothing. Um, So I said, okay, I'm going to have back surgery. So I had back surgery. That was life-changing. Took me right out of pain. Woke up the next day, woke up out of surgery and felt like someone pulled the piece of glass out of the circuit board. Wow. And. Wow. Herniated discs are a huge pain. Yeah. Hugely painful. And sciatica is hugely painful. Yeah. Yeah. It was brutal. It was the most brutal pain I've ever experienced. I mean, it would be blinding at times, you know, literally blinding. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see, couldn't drive a car. Um, but so just like that pulled a piece of glass out of the. It was brilliant, wow. you know. So, but wait. <laughs> There's more. Um, so, come out of surgery. They want to get me rehabbed quick. And rehab was pretty quick for that. The recovery was pretty fast. Um, Which I started on basically right away. The only issue is I came back, was feeling great, back to my rookie level production. I started, I, I came back, we needed somebody to play left guard. I moved into left guard, never played left guard in my life. Play six games of the year. And they're like, Eb, you're on track to be an all pro. You, this is like, you're fucking dominating. So it's about week seven or eight. This is 11 weeks after surgery. We're in Pittsburgh to play the Steelers and I can't get out of bed. Whoa. My back is completely seized up. Whoa. Whoa. And it took another month. So I couldn't play that. I tried my damn I went into the locker room early we were in Pittsburgh came in early tried to get warmed up I'm like I'll be fine I'll be fine I pop some pills uh I get off the table and I'm like fuck I still my back is still seizing up I go and lie down in the locker room and I'm looking up at my offensive coordinator and and our head coach and they're like, Ed, can you go? And I'm like, yeah. And I tried to get up. I couldn't get up. They're like, all right, Ed, you're not playing today. So it was a game time decision. And it took about another month for them to realize that I had an infection in the disc. Uh, which was. Oh, man. You know, it was. Uh, I had to go on eight weeks of intravenous antibiotics. A nurse came to my house every day and injected me with these. Well, this is this is insane. So yeah. you go from feeling like it's much better, the piece of glass is out, to now it's like you're. I couldn't walk around my house. I was paralyzed. Seizing up. Yeah. 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 I'd be walking. Jeez. I was. It was the Monday after that we had come home, and we had a Monday night game against Baltimore. And I was like, I'll be good to play, you know. And I'm walking from the player's parking lot into the facility and literally I was brought to my knees with a spasm in my back. Yeah. Um, so I was done for the year again. Eight weeks intravenous antibiotics. That's so insane. Every day nurses come in the house. Yeah, every yeah. day nurses come in. My wife is pregnant at the time. Jeez. So it was a bit of a blessing. I got to be home and be with that and, yeah. you know, yeah. and experience the birth of my child, which was really a life altering experience. Yep. Um, Melting of the man's heart. Big time. Big time. Big time. And just seeing the, the strength of my wife and 
her power as a woman and it's yeah. incredible. You know, that's a podcast in itself. Um, but so I was about ready to be done at that point. Um, yeah. Well, actually, you know, to be honest with you, man, no, because that was my third year. That's just three seasons. It's crazy. That's three seasons. That's, yeah. Oh yeah. God, yeah. That's... Yeah. So wow. I worked my ass off, got back. In the midst of being at home, recovering from this, this infection in my back, I had, I'm watching the Today Show. I turn on the Today Show one morning and I see Jacksonville Jaguars team sold, head coach fired. That's how I found out that because uh, I wasn't going, they didn't want me going into the facility anymore at that point. It's with the infection and just, you know, keeping it as safe as possible. So I find out the team's been sold, head coach is fired. So I'm like, hey, man, I'm just going to fuck it. You know, I have one more year on my contract. I'm going to work my ass off, you know, come back and have a great fourth year. I do that. I come back. Got a new head coach, this guy Mike Malarkey, um, which his name says it all. <laughs> and uh, it was a terrible year, you know. I had completely lost my love for the game. I'd lost, I'd given, you know, I, I felt completely betrayed. I was benched four games into the season. After the first game of the season, we're playing the Vikings, and I have a dude thrown into my left ankle get a low high ankle sprain which really should have been a six to eight week recovery they hurried me back in two weeks like Eb, you should be able to play i'm like i'm I, all right man but i can't push to my i can't push off my left leg to move right like no, you should be fine i'm like okay so i did it you know and i got my ass kicked in a game against the bengals Got benched at halftime, and that just completely shattered my confidence, my trust in the team. You know, for me, football had been such a family experience. You yeah, know, these yeah. coaches were my father figures, my, you know, these were my people, my family, my. And all of that, I felt completely betrayed. No one could really talk to me about what was going on. I was trying to figure out, you know, why am I being benched? I worked my way back, got earned the starting spot back the next week and then was benched for the rest of the season and I just took myself out of it at that point. So after that season, I was really ready to be done. I mean, the team went 1-15. and 15. That was That's a really painful. Yeah, it's yeah. horrific. Yeah. I mean, it's already painful to be, you know, sort of a 7-9 a and nine year. But 1-15, well, guys, yeah. you're making your, your – off-season plans in October, you know, because yeah. you're 0 and 8, and you yes. just know where the season's That's going. Nuts. It's not fun, you know. And there's this balance between what you're describing as coaches and brotherhood and family, with also some strange, perverse, capitalistic incentives, uh -huh. where it's like, yeah, well, Eb, you can no problem two weeks high ankles, yeah. low low high ankle sprain, and a high ankle sprain is really bad. That sometimes requires surgery, but I had a low high ankle sprain, so it was on the cusp, so I didn't need surgery, but it needed a good, solid recovery time to repair, you know, and yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's egos are involved, there's all sorts of, you know, psychological things happening. Yeah. Take some of the pharmaceuticals, yeah. some of the painkillers, yeah. yeah, and you know perform. So there's this that whole like kind of gladiator mentality that yeah. you're talking about. It's like taking the player and throwing them on before they can actually heal fully. Oh, and, yeah. and that's so there's that balance between that too. But yeah, four yeah. years, man, you went through a ridiculous amount in four years in yeah. the NFL and for the Jags. And I mean, we're talking. All of the shoulder dislocations, the herniation, the infect surgery, the infection, um, the low high ankle sprain, the um, the shattering confidence, having to get back on, earning your spot back, go about to be all pro but not, and then having oh or one in fifteen. I mean, 
Yeah. This is nuts going yeah. through the change in ownership and coaching, like all of the, your, the birth of your daughter as yeah. well through that process. I mean, that's a nuts four years and it definitely births a beautiful treasure into the world. How of having all of that experience. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this I isn't went, even the bears yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, just to finish it up, I was about ready. I was ready to be done after four years. Talk to my wife, talk to my father in particular, um, talk to some teammates. We ha- I had this incredible teammate in the Jags. His name's Brad Meester. He's a starting center for them for 14 years. I said, Brad, man, I think I'm fucking done. You know, I don't know if I could do this anymore. He said, Eb, I think that every year. <laughs> he goes, you know, man, I think that for the last, you know, however many years he said, I, I think that every year I'm done after this. Jeez. And he said, wow, I just give it one more shot, you know, and see how it is. And he said to me, he's like, you know, man, I know how you feel. See how it goes, you know, maybe give it a shot. Let another get yourself signed by another team. Maybe you find your love for the game again. Yeah. Maybe you're re-inspired to play. And if not, you know you're done. Yeah. So yeah. I said, okay. So I had a couple workouts. I went and worked out for the Seahawks. And you're like about 30 at, or no, like 26, 26, 25. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You're only 25 or 26. Yeah. At the time. At the yeah. time. And yeah. And you went through all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. So I go, I work out for the Seahawks. Oh my god. They gosh. were like, eh, we'll let you know if we want to sign you. Uh, I fly from Jacksonville to Seattle, spend 24 hours, work out for them, meet with everybody, fly back to Jacksonville. The next day I get on a plane, fly to Chicago. Work out for the Bears right away. They're like, Ed, we want to sign you. We want you to stay here. Uh, you know, so from that moment on, I, I, and it was like I was in tears. I didn't know if I wanted to do it anymore. And here this team wanted to offer me a new contract. So I thought that was great, you know. Um, yeah. And I just took it. And I sort of, you know, played it as it was and sort of fell in love with it again. Had a great year. Got to be the sixth swing tackle, and they carved out this nice blocking tight end, monster tight end role for me, which I was really successful at, and I brought a lot of production to the offense. The Chicago Tribune even wrote an article about how much more productive the offense was when I was in there. So I'd play like 20 to 30 snaps a game. I was perfect, you know, and I fell in love with it. I was kicking ass. Yeah. I didn't have to be a starter. Um, it was a great bunch of people. Chicago's an incredible sports town. It was a great experience. I lived right in the city, you know, and so it was a great football. It was the football experience I needed to feel good about being done, you know? Yeah, and also have a good taste of the game uh-huh. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was like, I'm this is Chicago what, delivered that yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had a one year deal there. And after that year, I thought, man, I could really get a solid free agent contract out of this. Nothing really came. So I signed back with Chicago for one year. And at that point, all the magic was gone. The coach's egos got really saturated in the energy of the team the team fell apart. All the all the magic of that first year in Chicago is really gone. Wow. You know, and I have to I mean, football is an energy game. It's all energy. It's the ultimate team sport and it's a trickle down from the top, you mm. know. Mm. So the success of a team on Sunday is really a it's it's a um it's a extension or it's a uh, illumination of the success of the inner team. You know what I mean? That's right. So ownership, front office, head coach, coaching staff, players, you know, it all works down. And so the more that the inner world of everyone involved is in, enlightened, yeah, 
though. And in alignment. And in alignment, yeah. Congruence. Uh, it all flows on the field on Sunday. It all flows on the yeah. field on Sunday. And, you know, and the juxtaposition of that is... God, it's so true about entrepreneurship, too. Right? You know, yeah, of course. Companies, of Same course. Thing. Same thing. So it was a beautiful experience, you know, looking back at my football career. It was such a beautiful experience of understanding concepts of success or the concept of success what makes something successful you know and it all comes back to the same thing you know whether it's the microcosm of your individual life or the macrocosm of your company's success it all comes back to the same thing are you in alignment with your truth are you in alignment with your energy you know and so looking back that all of that, all the pain, all the fucking trips to the hospital, the surgeries, the the crushing lows, the the devastation of my confidence and my trust in myself and trust in the people around me who I was working with. It all gave me the knowledge and experience necessary to do what I'm doing now. That's it. You know? Yeah. So, I mean... There was a time where football or talking about all of this was really painful and difficult. And even watching football. I couldn't watch football for the last three or four years. And this year I'm watching just about every game. Yeah. Just because I have such an appreciation for yes, yes. the dance. Yes. You know, the art of That's it. it. You know, the art of competition. Um, yep. And I can love that and I can be in that. And... Uh, I feel super blessed, man. It's fun to to come and talk about it and and to to re <clears throat> dive into that old box of memories because it gives me new context around the experience, you know. You're now diving into it from a much more enriched, wiser perspective yeah. and yeah, it does it's like revisiting that book or movie or song after several yeah. years of the evolution of one's own awareness. So one more thing on that before you jump in. You know, I yeah. was for a long time, and this goes into something else I've been thinking about. You know, I looked at my career as a failure, you know, my football career, because I had this idea, I'm going to play 10 years in the NFL. I'm going to do this. I'm going to become this. So for a long time, I was draped in shame and doubt and this uh, feeling like my football life was a failure, you know. And so, like you said, being able to apply that lens of wisdom and distance from it, now I have such a great appreciation for it all. All right, let's hit this from so many different angles. All right, one of the angles is that, <laughs> like, athletes have this incredible relationship between the mind and the body as a vehicle in order for it to execute, whether it's football, soccer, basketball, hockey, baseball, tennis, golf sports that are team driven sports that are solo driven mm. and there's a ridiculous amount of people on the planet that have been through this sort of athletic process where it's a it's this realization in in some way over time that occurs which is that this body is a divine vehicle and that we have to do a better job at individually taking care of it and also having the incentive structures in the sports industrial complex let's say that takes yeah. care of the true soul and not kind of having that perverse incentive of trading out cogs in a machine type uh -huh. thing and so there's we got to have that more holistic health driven soul driven perspective on it yep and then the other thing that you were mentioning i thought was super interesting was kind of like in a sense, this is in chapter six of high level perception, this part on the evolution of consciousness, where it's almost as though whether the 
it's happening in the sports arena or whether it's happening in the entrepreneurship arena, as we were saying, or whether it's happening in the civilizational arena, uh -huh. the more that you have people in places of power that have egoic levels of consciousness, the more you're going to have misery unfold. Uh -huh. And the more that you have people that have experienced transpersonal or non-dual states of consciousness, higher level states of unity, God, consciousness, the more the they realize the self in the other, and then there's no interest to self-deal and, and hoard and have perverse incentives for just one's own mm. sake. Yeah. And so this is really important because it ties into that first thing that I was saying, which is that overall um, realizing that mind, body, spirit complex and that soul that's there and treating it that way with the next generation architectures that are more around flourishing and less around extraction and stuff like that. That was, I think, a key takeaway. Now, I want to ask you the question around how did you identify that throughout that entire process that rather than using painkillers, opioids, that there was this revelatory process for humans that was unfolding, which was the emerging market of cannabis mm. and healing through that. And then take us through kind of also like the activist process in these last couple of, of years. Yeah, it's a I great question. I can't believe you only went six years but you underwent all of this insanity compressed in yeah. a six year yeah. it's kind period. of mind-boggling thinking about it um i always gravitated towards cannabis or plant medicine i remember when i was like 15 or 16 it might have been sparked by watching the movie altered states have you seen that movie <sighs> william hurt he's a scientist who goes to mexico and he gets peyote and he starts going and does doing mm. these peyote trips and then he brings it back to new york and he's doing all this fucking these tests in his lab with a float tank and he'll take the peyote and he'll get in his float tank and he devolves into like a caveman Wow! and then he runs amok in the city and so he's like experimenting with this and uh eventually it goes haywire because he starts doing it too much and his his at the end he's like fighting through a complete decomposition of his physical body uh, which is, it's really interesting um, and terrifying. Um, I recommend it for anybody who's interested in these these sorts of ideas. Uh, but I had this interesting calling or gravitation towards doing a peyote journey. I still haven't done that. Peyote sort of got quiet throughout my uh you know, football career and ayahuasca emerged as I sort of started down the spiritual path. And, uh, but cannabis was always very intuitive. I was always very interested and curious about it. So really my, I did it, you know, I smoked weed once or twice in high school and had very intense experiences, very terrifying, like didn't want to do it again. Uh, and it wasn't until college when it was at the end of the season, we were all, it was a, a get together of all the O linemen. We had a bonfire in the backyard and someone brought a joint and we started passing this thing around and, you know, it was, it was a great experience of brotherhood and, uh, sort of ceremonially putting a period on the season. And that experience that we had all been through together. Yes. Great hardship, great physical hardship, giving it everything we had, being physically and emotionally exhausted from the year, and really getting to come together and have this moment, this ceremonial moment of togetherness and brotherhood and acknowledging what we had been through together. And I remember waking up the next day and I said, oh my God, 
if I had been up drinking alcohol all night, I'd feel like hell today. But I feel like I could go play football again right now. And I carried that with me. It was really, it was so intuitive. It was so, such a, a real experience of feeling as though I had been healed in this way. You know, and obviously I wasn't totally healed, but energetically I felt rejuvenated. So I always kept that in the back of my, in the back of my nervous system, I guess you could say. <clears throat> so dealing with cannabis throughout your college career is very tricky. There's drug tests all the time. They're at random. You never know when they're going to happen. So you can't really use cannabis in college. As an athlete. I think you also wrote in one of your posts that you can use cannabis in the MLB. And is it in the NHL is the other one? Uh, I believe MLB doesn't test for it. I don't think the NHL tests for it. Or if they do test for it, there's no punishment as long as there's no issues happening. No yeah. on the field or on the ice or off the ice issues happening that are of concern. But in the NFL... Cannabis is under the substance of abuse test, which is an annual drug test. And you generally, you have an idea of when that test is going to happen. It's going to happen sometime between when you first report to uh, the facility in the spring, around April. It can happen anytime from that day to about the first week of training camp. So you've got April, May, June, July, August, about a five-month window where you have to be very mindful because this annual substance of abuse test could come anytime. But once that test happens, you're free to use cannabis at will. Oh, interesting. So once you get a hang of that, you know, you talk to the guys, sort of, you know, the cannabis users, they come, they come together, you know, yeah. <laughs> they, they find yeah. each other in the locker room. And I was always and very a big difference between the psychoactive THC components and then the more uh, bodily rejuvenating potentially other cannabinoids, CBDs, this type of stuff. Huge difference, like that would definitely. Also, but at that yeah. time, you know, there wasn't all of this. There wasn't. I was getting a bag of weed, you know, from the the trusted <laughs> the trusted team dealer, you know. Uh, there was no CBD tinctures and this strain and that strain. It was just, you know, pay way too much for an ounce of, you know, God knows what. Um, and I would say, I would argue that, you know, this idea of recreational cannabis use, you're most people, if you're using cannabis, you're using it to self-medicate for some one issue or another whether that's to de-stress or to deal with back pain, whatever it might be. Creative strategy is another one that we, so there is the medicinal side of it, S sleep as well and digestion and all these other pain, all this other stuff. But then there's rare diseases that are healed with large doses of hemp CBD. We've had people on our oh, show definitely, on that. Definitely. But then there's also the creative strategy side of things, which is super interesting because what happens is there's the, in neuroscience, we have the default mode network and what microdosing, uh -huh. microdosing yeah. enables is the slow releasing of the grip. Uh, uh -huh. And then you enable new creative connections to happen. Totally. And then as long as you basically anchor the creative strategy session in execution like the next week uh -huh. the next days and the next week yep. that way you actually actualize the goals rather than only staying in creative strategy mode anyway there's the creative I love side that. as well yeah yeah. yeah yeah you get very nuanced yes obviously um but so as gladiators as warriors i found cannabis was very intuitive you know many guys i say 50 percent uh one of my teammates on the bears Marty Bennett, Martellus Bennett, who's a great tight end. When he came out of his career, he said that he thought more like 75% of guys use cannabis. Yep. Um, so there's that. So I used it very intuitively. You know, it became a very, it was a very intuitive medicine for me as my physical body wore down and my emotional body was in a constant state of stress. Cannabis was really the one thing I could come home, I could smoke a little weed, and I could feel totally decompressed. I could leave football there, and I could relax. I could rejuvenate. I could get a great night's sleep. 
Meanwhile, having all having this experience, this firsthand experience of being handed a thing of opiates, taking a prescribed dosage, feeling irritable, insane, rage at the surface of my consciousness when I'm in the most vulnerable position, you know, dealing with a dislocated shoulder, having a herniated disc in my back, where I literally needed people to help get my get myself dressed. I needed help doing everything. I was in a state of complete chaos. Waking up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with withdrawal symptoms on a prescribed dosage three days in. Um, I've, I've since, since coming out of my football career, I had a DNA test done where it said that I have a variance in my genetic sequence that makes me highly susceptible to opiate side effects, which is really interesting. So opiates, I, I knew they just weren't, they didn't work for me. You know, they made me feel really insane, really intolerant. Uh, they didn't do much for the pain. They made it really difficult to sleep and get rest and heal. So cannabis really intuitively, I kept coming back to it because I could decompress physical, emotional, psychologically, psychologically. I could get a good night's rest. I could come home and connect with my family and friends. I could, you know, live a decent level quality of life, you know, for the amount of pain that I was in. So coming out of my football career and towards the end in Chicago, I don't think I took any opiates anymore. I, I used as my, as far as pain management goes, I used cannabis basically solely as my choice for pain management during my last couple of years. Um, so I come out of my football career, like I said, I was completely obliterated physically emotionally spiritually mentally had no idea who I was complete loss of identity no idea what I was going to do to make money put food on the table jeez that's another thing is the whole athlete after career thing yeah gosh that's (laughs) another big beast that nobody fucking talks about enough yeah absolutely And and what about the money that is being made while the players are in the athletics as well yeah to be able to actually allocate that adequately towards long-term wealth creation so that afterward that we have the yeah uh, yeah and this is all good right yeah we're yeah we're good this time that was just an update virus protection one yeah 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 we're good this time um, so yeah that's another nuts thing yeah yeah too. i mean that's because a whole podcast in, in its itself own. yeah we have to be set up for that long-term wealth creation and also to do things after age 30 or after age 40 if you go yeah. 10 years or 20 years yeah or 5 or 15 or however long uh-huh. but we have to be set up to do something and yeah. there could be a whole industry in just working with athletes on long-term wealth creation and doing things after they finish their careers yeah that could be a whole interesting industry okay absolutely man you're gonna get these little like bits <laughs> from me because these are things that i've been thinking about for a long ass time and yeah that we just don't we we haven't had um enough athletes come on the program to unpack this type of stuff uh-huh. so you're you're pulling some really good triggers from me on uh-huh. wanting to correct perverse incentives think long term uh-huh. about these types of things so i love it yeah it's great man um so I'm sitting there, I'm, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? And my wife goes, well, it's time to write your book. I had a stack of journals from the time I was in college, just keeping this. notes throughout. She says, now it's time to write your book. And I said, okay. Uh, it's a great idea. God bless my wife, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I started writing a book. Uh, my football agent passed me off to a literary agent. Went down the rabbit hole, wrote up a whole book proposal. Um, Publishers liked it, but they wanted either more dirt or the red carpet story of a Peyton Manning, a Tom Brady. So, What does that mean? um, They just wanted more glitz and glamour or they wanted it to be a more, I, I don't know, to talk shit on people i you know i don't i don't know i was like well this is the story it's this charles is a, bukowski is, yeah exactly as an offensive lineman yeah you know? i love that yeah 
That, that's actually uh, funny. You, only now after you say that is there some sort of like visual yeah. resonance to yeah, me yeah. to that. Uh-huh. But it totally makes sense now. Yeah. Go all the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's you. That's for sure. You know, I love yeah, it. man. I love so it. they didn't like, like that, though. Well, I think that a lot, a lot of people liked it. Um, I think they liked it. There was great feedback. Some of the publishers who were most interested said, well, we already filled our our uh, sports book quota for the year, so we have to pass. Wow. It's that thing we talked about, the you know, the corporate publishing, publishing monster, monster, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, man. So I wrote this article. I wrote a, a massive article uh, for sportsillustrated.com, and it got a huge amount of reach. Um, I even had, you know, old athletic trainers calling me saying, how the fuck could you say all this? And I was like, dude, I didn't name you. I didn't, I yeah. really, I was just talking about my experience and From you the know, heart, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. You know, you want me to say that he was like, you painted us like we didn't give a fuck. And I was like, no, I didn't. You know, I thought I painted the coaches more like they didn't give a fuck, but, um, you know, it was what it was. It was what it was. You yeah. know? Yeah. So I had a very heated exchange with my former head athletic trainer from the Jags. God bless him, Mike. I hope if you're out there, lots of love to you, man. Yeah. Um, but so it it sparked this new thing of yeah. uh, then I got a call from a producer who's doing this documentary, Take Your Pills, which is on Netflix, which documents my whole Adderall experience, yes, yes. which is a whole other thing. Um, but then... I get connected to, so cannabis was this very integral part of my healing experience throughout my football career. So I got connected to this guy, Kyle Turley, who was one of my childhood heroes, all pro offensive tackle. We had had the same agent and he was very much the tip of the spear in the cannabis as medicine for pro football players movement. Is that, is that called Neuro XPF? Yes. That's that, his company. That That's his is, CBD company, Neuro dude, XPF. And believe it or not, Neuro XPF and again, Kyle Turley. Turley. Yeah. Kyle Turley, shout out because. Yeah, love Kyle. Because Kyle Turley and Neuro XPF are what. Are what. Sarah Baker and Kristen Price from Hoop Beauty use to heal their rare cluster of diseases Love it. and yeah. they use those large doses of hemp CBD yeah. neuro XBF in order to be able to heal. And they Love traveled that. around the world to different physicians uh-huh. to the best of the best. And they could not figure out how to heal that cluster of rare diseases. And they were, they're teenagers, bro. They're teenagers. They can't get through the rare cluster of diseases they're undergoing losing hair prom like not being able to move grip a pencil etc wow. all this different type of stuff and it was kyle turley and neuro yeah. xbf and hemp cbd so Love i just want to shout out because if he's yeah. that's also coming at an ath- athletics angle uh-huh. as well yeah. we we should have kyle on that yeah you should be, definitely yeah, that's a good one kyle's incredible he's a revolutionary um, you know, through COVID, he's been saying CBD will take care of COVID. That's it. And he's gotten a lot of flack for that, but I think he's right on, man. Um, he's an absolute revolutionary and we need him. So I got connected with Kyle and Kyle said, this was probably five years ago now. Kyle said, Eb, I'm doing a cannabis conference out in Phoenix. I'd love for you to come and tell your story and speak. You know, at the time I was like, man, uh, all right. I don't really know what else, what I'm going to say, but I guess I'll just say how cannabis helped, how I feel cannabis helped me during my NFL career, et cetera. So I was like, yeah, Kyle, I'd love to. Any way I can support you because, you know, he was such a prototype of what I was seeking in my football experience. Um, So I go to this cannabis conference in Phoenix and it's Kyle Turley, Nate Jackson, who played tight end for six years for the Broncos also a New York Times bestselling author one of my good friends Uh, I highly recommend his first book Slow Getting Up which is an incredible detailing of the football experience 
uh, Ricky Williams, and me. And we're in this huge conference hall. There must have been 500 to 1,000 people. And uh, I'm looking around this room, and it's military veterans, and it's cancer survivors, and it's these families with Dravet syndrome, uh, these mothers of children who have these severe seizure disorders, um, who have all been healed by cannabis. Yeah. You know, and here we are, having played professional football, and you know beyond i don't i don't know for me there was no really other way i'm just sort of following god at yeah. that stage yes, you know yes, yes. and i'm telling my story i don't know what it means and i say i tell my experience of how i use cannabis just about every day throughout my football career and dealt with all these injuries and how i feel like i came out of my career in better shape because of it and i'm looking around this room and i'm just sort of in awe at the breath people that this affects in a positive way and so next up comes Kyle Turley and he starts talking and he opens up with the federal government has a patent on cannabinoids as neuroprotectants and antioxidants it's patent 6,630,507 and I'm just like whoa what the fuck and he goes on to say how through scientific studies, the, you know, uh, department, the NIH, um, these government bodies, governing scientific bodies have done all these scientific studies to see how cannabinoids can help heal the brain from damage and can also help prevent damage before it occurs in, in the brain. They have a patent on it. Cannabinoids as neuroprotectants and an anti antioxidants. antioxidants. And you write about this in your blog post on the subject. Yeah, yeah and it blew my mind. You know, it, it fucking blew my mind. And then he goes on to talk about how we all have an endocannabinoid system in our bodies. And our bodies produce our own endogenous cannabinoids. Mirror replicas of the cannabinoids found in the cannabis plant anandamide the bliss molecule to perform all sorts of issues you know our endocannabinoid system is involved in how we feel and deal with pain our appetite our sleep rhythm and uh, our mood uh, among yeah. myriad other things so my mind is blown and all of a sudden my entire experience as a football player because i was coming from this place you know, my cannabis use throughout my football career, I kept it very private because as a team captain, as a team leader, as a guy that coaches always look to to set the example for the team, my inner dialogue about my cannabis use was wrapped in shame. It was, I can never let anyone find out about this because I'll lose all credibility as a leader in this locker room. So my whole experience came to this crystallized point and it was all validated and legitimized when I learned about this. And it just set this fucking fire in my in my heart, you know. Yeah. I need to learn as much as I can about the history and science of this plant and how it works. And um, it validated everything. And it really set me on this path of <sighs> to not put too fine a point on it. It's being a truth teller, man, yeah. and seeking out the truth. You Especially know. when there's such a wide breadth of people that yeah. have been healed thanks to cannabis. Yeah. And now you're, <clears throat> with the help of what Kyle's saying, yeah. neuroprotective, antioxidant, yeah. endocannabinoid system. Yeah. What's actually going on yeah. on a planetary scale with the yeah. secretion of this yeah. and all of the different cannabinoids, all the different dosages, all yeah. the different applications of it. And so this and is meanwhile, wild, yeah. you know, meanwhile, my football brethren are in dire straits. Guys are being yeah. diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and dementia, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is really the, you know, the major issue affecting football players at this stage, which is a degenerative neurological disorder caused by the subconcussive hits and the constant hits to the head. And I'm like, here's this medicine. It's a fucking medicine for this. So I formed an organization called Athletes for Care, which was basically all of us ex-pro athletes who had had this experience, which was a lot, and continues. It seems like every day there's people coming out of the woodwork 
talking about how cannabis has affected them in a positive way. And I think really it comes down to this, you know, corporatization, corporatized mindset and the athlete, you know, I can't say the truth about my experience because I'll lose endorsements. I'll lose my contract. I'll lose this and that. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason I was, (laughs) I was blessed with a very, uh, anarchical stance and a, um, a passion for resisting the powers that be and the the so-called authority figures that claim to make all the rules and you know break through all of that with just the truth of the experience you know so it was a very powerful thing that happened for me in my life after football to really set me into what it is I'm here to do you know Man, seeing the brothers in athletes, seeing the the sisters in mm-hmm. healthcare, seeing the all the different use cases that in, indigenous have been applying it to, seeing the myriad benefits, and then seeing the all the brothers and sisters that are also jailed. Um, and in that process because of it so um i mean this is yeah this is a really big awakening planetary wise one thing that i would say about the emerging market of of cannabis and hemp is that and i would say that the same thing applies for psychedelics and entheogens and the same thing applies for decentralization blockchain cryptocurrency smart contracts is that as we have these massive emerging markets happen, it's super important to inclusively stakehold everyone in the fruits that emerge from them. Because usually what happens is that you get the people that come in early and make the investments that reap the vast majority of the benefits. And then the rest of the people get breadcrumbs. And that rather it's that everybody should be stake held in the growing pie of the yeah. uh, massive emerging markets that are happening in this case absolutely yeah so that absolutely would be one well thing yeah that's uh if you want to get involved there's a great uh movement the last prisoner project headed by steve d'angelo that you can support and that's all about getting you know the the non-violent marijuana possession people out of jail because there's yep. hundreds of thousands of african-american men and women who are serving way too long in prison sentences that should be set free and you know meanwhile all of this is putting a lot of money in people's pockets yeah meanwhile the dea teamed up the cca (laughs) i know i know i know it's horrible and i'm grateful we've had steve on the program and i agree you have yeah oh nice yeah i love him adore him steve's the man he yeah gave us several times the breakdown of you know, the multi-decade process that has, that we've undergone with Uh the liberation of cannabis on the planet. And, and there's, think about all the creative economic value that the hundreds of thousands of people, um, can be driving to our planet by not being just sitting in jail, rotting away. Absolutely, man. Yeah. So, so then now where did that launch you into, uh, you know, ebb and flow, podcasting, you know, book writing, hotbox with Mike Tyson. You know, you kind of have your 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 found passion for making the case for cannabis to athletes and disseminating that. So, yeah, walk us through these last especially couple of years. Uh, so I started Athletes for Care, which really provided this new community of like minded individuals. And also to establish a safe third-party resource for athletes coming out of their careers to come and get information, education, financial opportunities, work opportunities, etc. Um, through that, you know, I met a lot of good people, and you know, I'm always seeking out the my alignment with the universe, you know. Um, I'd always had this, obviously there's a, the love of writing, which writing is sort of the, you know, it's like going into the gym for your mind, you know, 
uh, for That's me. It's it. uh, to take the ideas that are happening in here and put them into some concrete format, whether that's on a pad of paper or in a computer, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, it's a great way to flesh out ideas and come to terms with things and figure things out and understand concepts and synergize ideas, etc. But beyond that, I had a radio show in Jacksonville. I got to know the, the music director of the local NPR station. I became really good friends with him. And he said, Eb, I have some open slots that I need to fill. Do you want your own radio show? I said, hell yeah, dude. You know, I came in and got to hang out with him one day. And um, I was doing a charity event at the time. And he said, we could pub, we could do a little PR on your charity event. And why don't you bring in a playlist of music and we'll play that as well. And we could talk and I'll show you how I do things. So I just fell in love with it. He gave me my own time slot. I got to make my own show called The Number 73. You could probably find somewhere uh, where I did playlists of music intertwined with um, poetry readings, literary experts or excerpts, um, you know, and I would make it all in a theme. So one was dreams. One was my, you know, childhood in Brooklyn, you know. Um, So that and I remember also having this experience I think about it a lot these days I would be in the locker room and just loving the exchange the conversation in the locker room you know you'd have a dip in on you know 20 milligrams of Adderall talking to a guy about all kinds of shit you know and I thought to myself I'd love to have a job where I get to talk to people in life after football um, at one point I thought maybe that was psychiatry or being a psychologist, which I'm, you know, that's very deep in everything I'm interested in. Uh, but that sort of as, because of my, my inner vibration of an artist, it's manifested itself in podcasting. Yep. So through the cannabis world, like I said, Nate Jackson was a good friend of mine. He lives down in Venice. And I said, dude, let's start a podcast. So that started with the Mindful Warrior podcast. I was like, we can just start talking about this experience of being ex-football players and life after football and how to heal yourself and you know the process of figuring life out from the point of view of an athlete. Um, so it started there. Uh that evolved into caveman poet society we had to change names because there was a mindful warrior out there already um in the midst of that you know i'm still doing we're doing speaking around the country around the world at cannabis conventions talking about cannabis as medicine for athletes and the benefits of it and you know um protecting against cte or being a a remedy to cte etc Uh, so I was cultivating this repertoire as being an expert in the field of cannabis as medicine for athletes, football players in particular, an old team doctor of mine. This is now early 2018 calls me up or maybe, oh God, it was 2017 calls me up and said, Eb, I'm coming out to L.A. next week. Mike Tyson's Cannabis Company is putting on a cannabis and medicine summit. And I think I would really like to introduce you to them. I know I've been following your career since you left. And it looks like you're one of the leading voices in this movement. I said, wow, okay. I mean, I've met, and at that point I felt as though I had met a lot of the players in the game. I had no idea Mike Tyson was even involved in cannabis. So I said, okay, I get introduced to Mike and his business partners. I end up having to put on the entire panel. I emceed it. I put together a whole presentation. I brought in a number of NFL, NHL, MMA fighters, uh, some doctors, some neuroscientists to come and do this really incredible panel that we filmed. 
Uh, long story short there, they said, Eb, this is Mike's business people. He said, Eb, we, we love your energy. We want to, we want you to just keep coming and hanging out here. Yeah. We'll pay you. I said, sure. You know, yeah. so that evolved into eventually they said, Eb, we want to start up Mike's podcast. We know you have a podcast. Can you help us produce that? So next thing I know, we're starting up hot boxing. Um, and at the time it was really interesting meeting Mike because he was in a very dark place. He was really struggling very much, um, still afflicted by his vices and in the grips of addiction. So throughout that process, the first episode of hot boxing that you can find on YouTube is with this guy, Dr. Jerry, who's a, uh, toad shaman 5-M-E-O-D-M-T so we brought him in Mike did the toad and uh, it was sort of this watching this miraculous spiritual awakening unfold throughout the course of that show Um, wow yeah yeah and you know in the process of that I really I, I healed a lot of my own pain through my experience with Mike and seeing this guy who is really a demigod of American culture. You know, he's our modern day Hercules. He's been at unimaginable highs, devastating lows, been in prison, been, you know, charged, convicted of rape. He's been a, you know, just the complete devastation of his entire life multiple times over and reimagined himself and found his way out of it and reemerged and and here he is and he's the most sensitive humble honest person I had maybe ever come into contact with you know because for him there was no other way you know, it was basically like kill yourself or be honest about who you are, yeah. you know, and what you've been through. Yeah, yeah. That's and it. Uh, that really resonated with me and my journey, you know, going back to when I was a little kid, you know, and this idea of, you know, coming to the middle way. You know, we get so attached to who we're supposed to be and how it's supposed to look and what success is and you know, the shame of all our failures and being wrapped up and not, not, uh, realizing all of these dreams and fantasies and ideas we had of ourselves early on and just getting wrapped up in all of that. And it's like, let all that shit go, man. And just, who are you? What are you here to do? Yep. What's your truth in the moment? Um, yep. so through that process, you know, I mean, I really coming sitting here in front of you today, man. It's the most in my feet I've been since leaving football, you know. Yeah. And it's a constant process. You know, we took this uh my dad just just my dad just moved out of Brooklyn, New York. Lived there for 40 years. Um and during high school, he actually moved out of Brooklyn, came to L.A., saw my brother and I get through high school, hated L.A., moved back to Brooklyn. So he's there now again for the last 15 years. He just left Brooklyn and moved to Tucson, Arizona. Okay. And uh, we spent the week there. That's right. My cool. wife and daughter, yeah. we spent the week there, and um, it was beautiful. You know, it was such an incredible experience. I have this really interesting thinking about my relationship with my dad and how close we are emotionally and energetically, how much we've been through together. And yet we've always had this space between us, you know, because my parents were divorced. I got to see my dad once a week. And then at times when we moved across the country from each other, I'd see my dad once a year. And uh, I was feeling really grateful for this experience of now having him closer. And I actually, I, I want to move to Tucson. I want to get out of L.A. That's kind of where, I'm, yeah. where I've gotten to, yeah. especially through COVID. And, you know, my wife has a thriving 
estate planning uh, law practice here, which, you know, we'll figure that out. And maybe it'll be a partial move at first, which is fine. But towards the end of the trip, I was having this dread sort of descend over me. And, uh, you know, I feel very deeply. It's one of my gifts. Yeah. And my dad has said to me since I was a little kid, he said, Eb, you're so sensitive, you know. Um, which at times I took very critically, but that's really I've come to cherish that, my sensitivity. Because yes. I feel so deeply, you know. I feel... unbelievable highs of joy i feel soul crushing lows of despair and grief and sadness <sighs> and i was feeling you know and a lot of my childhood was draped in dread and uncertainty and uh i started having this feeling of dread and i'm really on this trip over the last you know it's all a process you know Seeking the pearl necklace that's around your neck the whole time. And really getting into that. Mm -hmm. You know. Wherever it is. Mm -hmm. Because we're constantly, you know, in my in my own spiritual evolution and my conscious evolution. We spend so much time trying to redirect and get out of the feelings that we're feeling and go somewhere else. I'm feeling this, I'm uncomfortable. I need to do this. Let me go jack off. Let me scroll through Instagram. Let me hop into work let me do this let me do that you know it's like yeah. when is the time to just feel the feelings that you're having exactly you know exactly so Conscious. i started having this dread sort of just sort of start to trickle down and it was the friday we were leaving on saturday and i had this really beautiful experience of just allowing it man and just feeling it and being like wow what a what an incredible experience to be here and like, this is it, you this know, is it. this is it, Yeah. this right here, yep. you know, what a gift, Yes. you know, and it just, the dread just goes away, vanished, yeah. it disintegrated, yep. it was gone, and it was like, wow, I'm still here, you know, self-realization, embodied, anchored, yeah. God consciousness, Christ consciousness, unity consciousness it eradicates all of those roots of misery it yeah anchors right into the present moment the bliss peace yeah. joy peace love compassion for everyone everything yeah perfection infinite absolute it's amazing that's I, it and to consciously re-baseline to that is the thing it's the paradox we were talking about yeah. you are both perfect and you want to work your way into a place where you can re-baseline that infinite absolute peace joy bliss state of being uh, and also become an artist from that place so uh -huh. you write your book from that place yeah every business deal you do comes from that place mm -hmm. every relationship with your child or your wife or your other friends comes from that place yeah other countries around the world geopolitically comes from that place everything comes from that place and that's ultimately one of our big keys that we're unraveling on the program and trying to really yeah. embody in the awakening in los angeles because you're going it sounds like might be going to tucson and we're like well i'm here maybe. you know hey you know it's also that thing wherever you go there you are there you are you that's know right. and i'm not in any hurry it's just uh you know, man, as my life, as I get older, and here I am, I'm 33, you know, and I feel like I've lived multiple 60 lifetimes. 60 years, yeah, know. it sounds like it, my <laughs> brother. That you that six-year chunk of time sounds like a whole lifetime, that yeah. six years. Yeah. And, and everything uh, you've learned and packaged from it and are now bringing as a treasure uh -huh. from that, yeah. it's so awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, it's just I'm slowing down. I'm, I'm sl I said this to someone while we were there. I said, I'm slowing down faster and faster I these days. I hear that for sure, my man. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just, it's you like know. It's like a balance, though. Cause yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, I love L.A. I convinced my wife to move back here, you know. Her family's from Pasadena. So I convinced. I love L.A. I love it, you know. It's been always such a 
you know, you can really express yourself here. You know, That's let right. yourself run fucking wild in LA, That's man. It. That's and it's it. not, there's no boundary for that. And I've always had such a great appreciation for that. Um, and I think, you know, I still have work to be done here. Totally. For sure. Um, but yeah, man, you know, it's like, it doesn't even, it, re- it doesn't matter where I am. It's just like, this moment is it, you know? Yes. And you are it, like we said. You are it. That's you are it, it you yeah. know. Because we just spend we spend so much time, especially in America, I think. You know, we're we're really the subject focuses on the object yeah. all the time. Yeah. And it atrophies the muscle of the subject investigating its own awareness. Yes. And realizing that diamond necklace already around the neck. Yeah. 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 That's the key. You know. We must get that into the heart of the most influential people here. We gotta do that. Well, that's, that's the thing. Or like you said, man, in 10 years, you know, we'll be the most influential people on too. the planet. That's you know, we'll exactly. be making all the decisions. That's it, too. So the you'll be running for president. That's it. Yep. I'll that's be, it. you know, somewhere. We'll, we'll have our animated series and yeah. our anthologies and all these yeah. ways of mimetically disseminating these deeper self-realizations. Yeah. As you were telling me about your story... I found it so cool that, you know, you had to seize. I just I love sharing these moments because you really have to seize the opportunity that you're given when, you know, when Kyle is talking to you about these cannabis summits and the way that people are gathering, healing their biggest traumas and across different industries, people are healing themselves, whether it's athletes or healthcare or or any sort of aspect. Um you put together the panel you put together the panel of brilliant minds you have to be a synthesis in order to do that across those different disciplines to share those stories and then you you get exposed because once you knock 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 you answer that door and you really work hard at setting up something beautiful what happens is knock 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 the next door comes and the next door is something really Uh, another rocketing opportunity your own podcast all of the guests that you get to feature on your podcast and learn from like a sponge you know the knock knock you know we trust you with the mike tyson and his investor group that wants to really rocket cannabis to the next level also rocket healing yeah mike sounds insane by the way the ups and downs because those you know your ups and downs are nuts a lot of other people's ups and downs are nuts mics are insane yeah and but to find where he is now sharing his treasures mm-hmm. with you on the program and you act as this really nice catalyst because mike kind of leans back a lot mm-hmm. and kind of inserts wisdoms yep. strategically yep. and you kind of draw out the wisdoms of the guest that's on the program and also insert your strategic philosophy and wisdom along the way. And I think that he definitely needs that and that you work at a good spot in that process. And so you're basically both advocating for, in a sense, awakening to uh-huh. the both the healing processes that occur from the traumatic unfoldings of people's insane ups and downs but also really shining those treasures and catalyzing the shining of the treasures on the other side of those mm-hmm. and you guys are both catalysts for that and so yeah you have you have many strategic metaphysical perspectives that are enabling you to be that shining beacon right now and and even our back and forth today is really deeply resonant it's like very much so a part one of a where you flower as your unique aroma of who you are as your conscious agent and it's very much so highlighting the journey and i just i know that part two and beyond are like really focusing in on what we just unpacked there which is that god consciousness that exists right here right now but that we atrophy the muscle of the awareness and that consciousness of investigating its own nature, and especially children, that we must be the catalyst for them to do that process that then enables the sustainable development goals to be solved yeah. and so many other things that we want to 
that we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I really want to snap people out of the illusion that they're living under, you know, taking life for granted. Because that's really like a big issue of this whole thing. People just take life for granted. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this the other day and even sitting here with you, you know, when you're really. (laughs) It's funny. It's funny. It is. Because you spend your entire life viewing the world and the people around you through this very specific lens. Like even when we're here, like communicating and having this dialogue and sitting across from each other, you know, there is this perspective, this, this lens, this container put around it of me being the interviewee and you being the interviewer, Yeah, you know? And so my mind just naturally starts to put all sorts of expectations and uh, perceptions around what you're going to say so that I can be prepared to respond in a specific way. And I was thinking about this with my wife the other day and I'm sitting there and I'm watching her and I'm looking at her and we're talking and I just think to myself, my God, look at how magnificent this is, you know? Yes. Like how magnificent it is to sit in front of this being who is a just a completely fluid stream of life happening and yet you know my mind is because you know once you it's a process you know i have an issue with guys like for instance sad guru i don't know if you know much about sad guru yeah who's who's a great i'm balanced about that I think we're great about spiritual to go. teacher, but he also, you know, he has this thing where he said, there's no, basically it's all here. Stop trying to do anything. There's no process. There's no nothing. It's, it's there. It's you're there already. And while that is true. And the other thing, you know, that, uh, is it, is it roomy or it's yeah, roomy, roomy which, about the pearl necklace yes, yeah, that you're always yes. seeking is around your neck. Yeah. So there is that. You are everything. You can, in your container, there is everything you will ever yeah. need to be all that you are and all that you are destined to be in this universe, you know. But at the same time, there is a process yeah. of yep. realization. That's it. You know, yep. especially when you're in the modern era. That's it. Yep. Because we've been programmed and conditioned with so many layers of relatability and understanding and and uh, perspective so you know in my relationship with my wife i'm sitting there and i'm having a discussion with her and i'm noticing wow i've got this sort of there's this veil of perception where i'm relating to my wife through an expected flow of dialogue yeah yeah but when i let go of that that's it yeah i have no idea like dude like you and it's like it's so when you let go of that and and it's not like you can just do that you know you can't really do that without putting the work in it's a muscle yeah yeah exactly you really step into the magic of life you know enlightenment is a habit yeah yeah, and so we re we re baseline ourselves yeah into that place that you speak of and it ends up just transforming our energy completely. Yeah. I, one of the one of the most I think important things to do in this process is to do what we call omni level perception. Right? Uh, Ted Achacoso brought this up when yeah, I shared I love with him. Love Doctor Ted. Man. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. Exactly. Yeah. We yeah. both had him on. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, because what it means to have omni level perceptions, it means that you can take on the perspective of everything happening at once Mm. and that means that means outside of my own conscious agent perspective i go to well what's what's ebb feeling right now how is he perceiving me while i'm perceiving him Uh and how's the audience perceiving this and how's china doing and saudi arabia doing (laughs) kenya like what are they up to right now Uh like can i hold the whole planet at once 
can I hold that whole omni level perception happening? And then that's only this planet, you know, that's, uh-huh. that's not, uh-huh. that's this one song universe uh-huh. out of everything that is potential. And so, yeah, when we, when we start expanding ourselves to that degree, like even for a moment there, I just, you know, like my, everything became way less dense. And uh-huh. I felt way m- more light. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious once we take our visions to the next level and we keep creating that as we talk about when we can fill 50,000 people into a sports stadium yeah that's empty 90% of the time and we put them in there for a full day on what we're talking about right now wow yeah what one day, it? man, we're going to do that. We are going to do that, <laughs> my man. It'll probably be sooner than we realize. Yes. You know? Yes. Dr. Ted said the most incredible thing I think I've ever heard uh, when he talked about enlightenment. He said, Eb, everybody thinks enlightenment is about what you gain. And really, enlightenment is about what you lose. lose. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I was like, fuck. That's it, man. Yeah. You know, just the letting go, the constant letting go, you know, I have a practice where I'll take walks. I love walking. Walking is one of my favorite things. Um, and walking and breathing. Yeah. And I'll breathe in. And then on every exhale, I'll just think to myself, let go, let it go, let it go, let everything go. You know, because you're also subconsciously, you're holding on to all kinds of shit you don't even realize. Yeah. You know, you're holding on to all sorts of things. Yeah. You know, and like you're, we're doing the, we're doing the show notes, which we have to do. You know, we have to have this, we have to have this, this perspective to relate to from, you know, we can't really, you can't come in here as a, as a being of light. It's like it's, no one it's gets such, it. There's no an, context. What you're bringing up right now is so fascinating. I was just thinking about it like 10 minutes ago while we were talking. It's like, what is most optimal? Let's say, let's just do an experiment right now, okay? Let's say that, let's say you come on the show, right? And this is usually what would happen on episode two with a guest. Because usually in episode one, what I try and do is I try and unpack the really basically the roots of the seed and its fruits right Mm. and so that way people when they feel your aroma in part one it's usually the fullness of your aroma from top to bottom as much as we can and then in part two usually what happens is we can dive right into the metaphysic and the consciousness Uh and and the and all the other kind of abstractions but also embodiment work that we're talking about right here at the end now, my question would be, what if in part one, we just went there? Uh-huh. And I don't know yet. I, yeah. don't, I don't know yet because it, it, it depends. It feels strange uh-huh. kind of bypassing yeah. that part of first part of it. Yeah, that's been a big question of mine and podcasting because I think to myself, is it interesting? Do we, because I know how I feel when I have to go and dive into my life story and I have to unpack it all, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, it, but to some extent for me right now, who I am, that's necessary to give people an understanding of what I've been through, exactly. where I'm coming from to give you the goods of yes. what I know. Yes, yes, yes. But you have someone like, Tony Robbins come on yeah you know or you have Snoop Dogg or someone who's very well known and you can dive right in because they have this sort of built-in sure. understanding sure sure but sometimes as a podcaster it's like well let's start with just tell us where you come from yeah, yeah. you know yeah and I've made it part of my art with the podcasting Let's see how we can tap into who this person is through this moment right here, right now, where we're at, where we came in here. Let's jump into the meat of the moment. Yeah, yeah. 
and let that let's let's let that fling us back to this moment in time where such and such happened. Yeah, yeah. You know what Stuff I mean? Stuff like that. So it would be like if we jump right into the consciousness and the metaphysic, maybe there's a maybe there's a moment where it goes, well, actually, Alan, one of the reasons why I feel this specific way about the nature of being is because when I was 22, uh-huh. this happened, and then we maybe go for three, five minutes on that, then yeah. we come back to the... You know, so there's all these different ways to explore the Uh the artistic expression on the canvas of the dialectic. And I'm still I'm surrendered in intuitive flow in terms of what optimization means in that regard, Uh because I know that after doing 700 of these, it just ends up naturally finding its its way. Right. The star is there, but it's very sandy in Uh terms of where there's no attachment, there's no craving, um, there's no solid chained up way of having to to achieve. So when we talk about the stadium as well, it's that we know intuitively that that's within the star and the trajectory and the planetary awakening, but we're not attached to having it happen at SoFi Stadium in 2023 uh-huh. on June 15th. Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's going to happen, but we're yeah, just yeah. we are, oh, we're yeah. loose about Yes, of course. Yeah, but we're also, you know, it's funny. It's a balance because the two poles that I like to say on this are people like, we've been talking about these paradoxes. They're, they're fantastic of you already are it and you're also constantly rebaselining yeah. that enlightenment as a habit. Another good one for this is where you have people like Gary Vaynerchuk that talk about eating shit for 10 years uh-huh. as an entrepreneur, which is true. And then you have Peter Thiel who says that why can't you achieve your 10 year goal in six months? Right. And so I agree with those two polls uh-huh. as well. Yeah. And so it's it, you, you, when you wake up in the morning, it's not so much about I'm surrendered to intuitive flow. Cool. I can <laughs> yeah. just do whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, it's like, actually, you should still do that show with uh-huh. app today. Like, yeah, yeah it's not yeah. like I'm just going to go to the park instead or whatever. Yeah. I know. It's very interesting, isn't it? It's all a paradox. <laughs> it's all a paradox. It's, it's all enigma. a paradox. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an enigma wrapped in a paradox. Yeah. <laughs> because, of course, man, I'm surrendered to the intuitive flow. I'm going to make it to the NFL one day. Yes. You know? Yes. But the the steps of manifestation exactly. or actualization. And so you see that thing, you visualize it, you know what it looks like, it feels like, it tastes like, how it's going to be. And then something happens in the mind-body synergy where you're, you just program yourself into it. Yeah. You know? That's it. Um, I have and that's part of the game going back to this thing you know if it was all easy why the fuck would we would be we here it? why would we do any of it you know if it was easy everyone would do it as my dad always says you yeah know? I have an interesting thought for you because you have a nine year old daughter we just had Maya on the show yesterday uh-huh. and it was our first by the way the I show. don't want to and like get, I, yeah i got i probably got a roll soon. pretty soon wrap yeah. soon reason why i bring this up is because children their state of consciousness their state of awareness their state of awe mm-hmm. their state of play mm-hmm. their state of creativity their state of not being dogmatically pressured into uh, an economic machinery as a cookie cutter Mm -hmm. as a cookie cut gingerbread cookie like that your daughter and you know maya yesterday and i would i would look at potentially what sort of children can do to loosen adults up to the investigation of their own awareness as they engage with their child or children in general because that that's hyper catalytic for this process that we're talking about of immersion the the children the child's all of a sudden you know maya was like let's go on the roof and i was like man i've been here three weeks and i haven't even went on the roof of this building 
<laughs> haven't even had the thought of it. I haven't even had the thought of it. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. we went on the roof and hung out up there for like 30 minutes yesterday. Yeah. This is yeah. the type of stuff I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I feel very blessed, you know, that my parents are very much that way. Like my dad is 63. And he's followed his intuitive, you know, he's followed his North Star from forever, you know, like as a being an artist, a painter. And it's never really been about money for my dad. It's been about creating from his heart space. And he just moved his whole life from Brooklyn, New York to Tucson, Arizona yep. and created this fucking unbelievable space for himself and his girlfriend who's a welder and also an incredible artist and my wife and I were talking and my wife really said that she's like what an inspiration to see this to have this example in our lives of what you can do you know at 63 you know and my wife comes from a very sort of I love my in-laws to death but they're just very buttoned up and sort of by the book and you know her father's a a successful 401k like wealth manager and her mother's a badass HR executive and very successful people but they're not that just wouldn't be sort of a organic thought process to pick up and move your entire life to a whole new place and say fuck it you know um and children, you know, that's such an important thing. You know, we get so rigid in our conditioning. Yep. We get so rigid and we get attached, you know. We get attached to what it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to be, what success is. I've got to make this amount of money. And what if you say forget that and let the universe take care of that, yeah. you know. And just enjoy the, the play of life. Yes. You know. Yes. Yes. Easier said than done. We're going to unpack a lot more of this. Yeah, we got to do another we, one. We will. Yeah, we absolutely yeah. will. And I also want to, um, as, a, as lots of people know, um, the link in the bio below to the Ebb and Flow podcast is there. The iTunes link's there. You can also find the Spotify link on on Eb's website and his Instagram's great as well. It's got a lot of inspiration on it. And one thing that we're going to try and do as well is we're going to aim to actualize the synergies between our nodal clusters of influence. And so we're going to hopefully see a lot of in nice interchanges between the powerful leaders that we have on our programs and stuff like that. Definitely. There's that. There's so many great creative thoughts for us. The very last question that I like asking, super silly, what's your favorite food? <laughs> My favorite food? Meal or like one singular piece of food? You get to pick. Okay. Um, I would have to say a great grass-fed ribeye and a salad, a green salad yeah. with avocado. Ooh. That's yeah. my that's my go to. Well, how do you like your ribeye cooked? You know, I'm, I always go medium. Yeah, yeah. I know they like to go yeah. medium rare, but I like it just a little bit more done. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, yeah. Like medium wells kind yeah. of my thing. Just some sea salt. Sea salt is what you do. Yeah, yeah interesting. Uh, and then grass fed. Grass fed. Grass fed's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Grass fed's the Have key. you went and hung out with cows on on the farm? as well no i'd like that's to fun. though man. that's a fun thing yeah. to do yeah uh you know i've been a, a fan of dave asprey and the bulletproof i sort of intuitively found my way to just very intuitively found my way to intermittent fasting and that's a ketogenic it. diet that's it. yep yep and that just works really well for me and i'm currently yes. reading uh superhuman by dave asprey mm -hmm. and um you know just listening to his breakdown of the minutia of healthy fat and the issues with industrial meat I was just loaded with bad fat and you know all sorts of things it's really interesting man and in the midst of it we have this you know there's a heavy vegan you know yeah. thing yeah, yeah. that 
I think is being dispelled by the by the day. That's, that's right. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. Which There's, is really interesting. The funny thing is, refined sugar is take is is fucked. Period. Oh, yeah. Which is hilarious. Yeah. It doesn't even yeah. matter what you do. Yeah. It's like everybody knows that all eight billion people on the planet should definitely not be drinking yeah. Coca Cola yeah. in mass. Oh which is so interesting. But then the microbiomes of people are different for if they should be more ketogenic or uh-huh. maybe if they should be a little bit more plant carb based. or plant. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But it's so funny that refined sugar is period like for everybody yeah. is really shit. Stay away. <laughs> That's so Stay funny. away. I know. Thank God. I mean, I think we're coming to that realization yeah. as a global culture. But yeah, yeah, it blows my mind if I see people drinking soda. I know. I haven't had a Coke in probably at least ten years. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yep. When I see a person drinking a soda, I'm like, "Fuck, really? Really? Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's one of the benefits of California. Not only is it like the sixth largest economy." on the planet as a state by itself, which is super interesting, but like Silicon Valley and Hollywood and San Diego are like really obsessed with health in uh-huh. many ways. And they lead yeah. the world in many ways in that regard. Um, mental health may be otherwise and stuff in LA, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but specifically health wise, like there's so many different, like, dude, you can get a $2 like little smoothie thing that actually has like fruits and vegetables in it rather than the $1 Coke or whatever. So yeah. people are, have figured out that, all right, lots more to unpack. Yeah, I love with it, so, so much more. Oh my goodness. And uh, wow, what an epic conversation. It was so lit that we had the first one cut. <laughs> the TriCaster just shut off. Super interesting that that happened. Very so interesting. We'll stitch these uh, together into the episode that we'll uh, publish as the final here uh, shortly. You guys will see that. Thanks for tuning in live for all those that did. Uh, let us know your thoughts in the comments below on the episode on all things that Ed was teaching us about. Have more conversation with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the future of leveraging cannabis as medicine, as healing for us, uh, for all things about the slowing down the investigation of consciousness and awareness of that truth. And... Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, scientists, engineers in your communities around the world. You can support us. Our show links are below. You can support us. Um, follow the Ebb and Flow podcast. Follow him on Instagram as well. His links are in the bio below. Um, check out the iTunes and Spotify version. It's coming to YouTube. Thanks, brother. Also, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Getting better and better at putting it up on YouTube because I which know people exciting. want that. So We want to see your emotional reactions, responses. That's right. Thank you. That's it. That's it, guys. That's it. Much awesome. love. Much love. Build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace.